Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with a like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will get started on today's episode where we'll be talking to one Dr. Erica Fuhrer Barker. Dr. Fuhrer Barker is an assistant professor in animal and poultry sciences at Virginia Tech and director of the Applied Animal Behavior and Welfare Lab, where she works with dogs and horses. She also coordinates the online master's program in Applied Animal Behavior and Welfare at Virginia Tech. She earned her PhD in psychology at the University of Florida in the UF Canine Cognition and Behavior Lab, and then her master's in behavior analysis at the University of North Texas in the Organization for Reinforcement Contingencies with Animals. She is a certified applied animal behaviorist, a board certified behavior analyst, and a certified professional dog trainer. Her research and publications focus on understanding domestic animal behavior and learning from a behavior analytical perspective, using applied behavior analysis to solve behavioral issues in dogs and horses and identifying interventions that improve shelter dog welfare. She's a passionate about, she is passionate about humane, effective animal training and working with owners, trainers, and shelter staff to improve their interactions with animals. So without further ado, it's our very great pleasure to welcome Erica to the show today, who is patiently waiting by. Erica, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. I've heard great things about your work uh, and your teachings from colleagues of mine, so I'm equally very excited about this and to share that with our audience. So let's dive straight into the first question. Erica, I was wondering if you could please take the listeners back and share a little bit about your journey, about your story, especially where you first got started and you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training. And we love stories, so don't be shy to share shut some. <laughs> That's great. I've got lots of fun animal stories. <laughs> It's not often I get to tell them all. Uh, so I grew up in Arizona and I had very generous parents that let me have all the animals pretty much that I wanted. Uh, so I had tons of rabbits and guinea pigs and chickens and horses and goats and pigs and dogs and cats. And I was a 4-H'er. I, I raised animals for small stock. So um, I showed them they were all my pets and I didn't sell them. Uh, but I also did one year of the dog project, which was my most embarrassing project. So it's sort of funny that I'm now a dog trainer. I had a golden retriever at the time. She was a juvenile. She's very young and bouncy and playful. And we had a lot of embarrassing shows together. But with her, I learned more traditional dog training. That was back in the day where, you know, choke chains were much more traditional dog training. And so that's what I started with. Um, it was never that harsh, but looking back, I wish I knew now what I knew then, or what I know now, I wish I knew then. So fast forward a little bit, uh, I went to, gra sorry, I'm going to start over. Fast forward a little bit, I went to undergraduate at Arizona State University in biology. And when I graduated, I gave myself as my graduation gift, a working line German Shepherd puppy. And I had wanted to go into competitive agility with her. And I just really loved shepherds because they seemed like they were a dog that could do it all. So I had her, she was about three or four months old when I moved to California to go to graduate school at Berkeley where I was doing some insect physiology before I switched topics. 
Uh, and she had separation anxiety and she had some reactivity and liked to chase bicycles. And I had to become a better trainer to keep up with her. Uh, before I left there, sorry, start over. Before I left for graduate school in Tucson, I did encounter a clicker trainer. So for a couple of weeks, I worked with a clicker trainer and it didn't quite click with me, um, literally, what the purpose of this was. I couldn't quite wrap my head around it. Uh, and then I moved to California and I took her to some dog training classes at a local shelter, which looking back on it were more of a balanced type of training uh, I think what we'd call it now. And again, I had not been that exposed to clicker training and she ended up, you know, receiving some more aversive training than now when I look back, I would have wished she would have experienced. So I, I feel, you know, quite bad for her being with someone that didn't know better. But I think that's a kind of a typical journey for a lot of folks, especially back then when clicker training was not as predominant. And I, my goal for her was still to really get into competitive agility and I luckily found a, a really lovely clicker trainer, agility trainer, uh, Catherine Horn in California. And she's really what set me on my journey with clicker training. Um, she really changed my view of training and how to relate to my dog. And, you know, when we think about being good trainers for our animals and shaping animals, she was really great at shaping my behavior of, you know, not chastising me for, you know, techniques I had learned before and really teaching me new ways. And I just had so much fun with um, my dog then, Miel, and she just really blossomed with clicker training. So all of the dogs and animals I've had after that can thank Miel for <laughs> teaching me to be a much better trainer and getting me into positive reinforcement training. So after that, uh, I adopted another German Shepherd from a Shepherd Rescue. And, you know, some of the things that I saw between him and Miel was that he always responded really positively to me. Sometimes when I'd call Miel for a recall, she didn't come back as quickly. And I sort of think that that might have to do with, you know, some of that early aversive training, that there was always that kind of hesitation, whereas Arrow was just, you know, back lickety split. So from there, I was really, really sold. Um, and like I said, I was going to grad school at Berkeley at the time. This is my, this is my uh, lesson to folks thinking of going to grad school. <laughs> Make sure you love what you do. Uh, insect physiology was certainly interesting to me, but I would go home and read books about dog training and dog behavior. And I thought, I am in the wrong field. I'm not going home and reading the physiology and flow dynamics that my professor wants me to read. So I stuck it out there longer than I should have, uh, but eventually decided that wasn't for me. And uh, I took a, I was really lucky and I took a job at Peninsula Humane Society in San Mateo and got to work there as a behavior associate and also helped with um, offsite adoptions. And I just really loved shelter work. Uh, I enjoyed my coworkers. Uh, I enjoyed what I did there and it was really, really enriching. And I just became really, you know, totally fascinated with animal behavior. So along the way, I became a certified professional dog trainer, did some private classes and uh, private consultations, group classes and private consultations, and uh, eventually found my way back to graduate school. So like I said, I was just reading learning and training books all the time, going to all the seminars I could find. And luckily I was in the Bay Area in California. So we had really fantastic people there, fantastic people coming through. I did a few weeks at the Academy for Dog Trainers on different, different topics. So I felt really lucky to be in such a progressive dog training community. And at a clicker expo, I met Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz and found out he had uh, a graduate program on learning and training in animals. And I was, I was just sold. So I earned my master's there. It was really fantastic. Um, and I feel, again, just really lucky to have found my passion and to have found a graduate program that worked for me. And again, with good timing, by the time I graduated from UNT, Clive Wynn had opened up his dog lab at the University of Florida, and I was lucky enough to become a student there where I completed my PhD. And uh, Along the way, I have a horse that's clicker trained um, and, you know, just taking our tools and our methods and our view of behavior into new fields like the equine field, I think is really exciting. I know that's a long answer. I can give you more, but. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we encourage people uh, to passion talk on this show. 
and it looks like Excellent. at some point in this episode, I want you to say to me, Ryan, what was the question again? <laughs> then I know <laughs> that I've done you said that you were lucky enough to become a student uh, at Clive Wynn School and then you just went on and got your PhD. And you said that, I feel very casually. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> if luck really was the right choice of words to describe how you ended up in that, like, in that. Uh, position in that context uh, it, it seems like this journey for you has been uh, one of continual growth and development I feel there's there's more there that you have as an individual that drives you and, and motivates you and, uh, and and gets you moving I, d- I don't know what it is and I don't know what my question is <laughs> but you know you go home and you read dog books and and were you always asking questions? Were you always just wanting to know more? Were you always – what drove you to kind of – because it's, it's just like step after step. You just, you're just climbing the ladder there as, as you're talking to us. And, and I just – there's obviously a, a deep – obviously, you tell me uh, – a deep kind of drive and, and motivation pushing you to continually learn and develop and grow yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. I, I guess when I say I was lucky with Clive Wynn's lab, I, I do feel lucky to have been there. And there was some t- there was timing. I think that was the luck part was that, you know, when I was looking before, he didn't have his dog lab, so the timing was critical. But you're right. I mean, I, I do feel like I just took these little steps and I started the way a lot of us start with um, a dog that was pretty challenging and. Uh, but I just loved her and working with her was so much fun. And then it kind of grows from, well, I'm training my dog to, well, I could help these other dogs. And you, and you kind of blossom from that into a trainer. And then from there, uh, I was lucky, like I said, enough to be in a position where I could go back to graduate school. Um, and so I got to take that next step and say, well, let, let me go learn about this. And I mean, you're right. I'm <laughs> Whenever I watch animals, um, I'm always thinking, why are they doing that? Um, how can I change that? How can I improve human-animal interactions? And then I'd also hear things that people would say very matter-of-factly, just these statements, dogs do X, horses do Y. And I kept thinking, well, I, how do we know that? Do we know that? Um, and how can I be a better trainer you're telling me this is the technique to use, but how do I know? Where's the data? And, you know, I think I've, I've always, I've loved school. Um, I like being in school and I like studying and I like learning. And so it was really natural to kind of combine my fascination with animal behavior and my love of education. Um, so y- you're right. I mean, I, I think there's always this sort of questioning of how do we know Um how can we do better? We don't really know that. You're, you're telling me I should train my dog this way or this works, but how do we know? And is there a better way to do it? So I think there is constant questioning. Um, and so much of what we hear, I think, gets debunked along the way. I, I think in our more progressive science-based training, not so much, but certainly before about um, needing to be an alpha. And that's what one of the, when I met with a behavior consultant Uh, when Miel was having issues with separation anxiety and chasing bicyclists and things like that, it was, do you let her sleep on your bed? I said, yes. Well, you can't do that. She's going to think you're, you know, she's alpha. And so I I wish I had questioned more then. I'm like, oh, I had no idea. Um, And of course that's not true, but I think there's so many statements out there and our our field is so rife with um, training lore and I would really like to put the science behind that. Uh, and so that really does drive me of, well, let's explore. Um, I hear or see these great practitioners doing great things. Let's see what's, what are the actual mechanisms that are working for them so that we can get rid of the stuff that's not necessary or use those mechanisms in really creative ways for treating other behavioral issues. And I'm, I'm grateful for people like yourself and people coming out of uh, the University of North Texas that are, because uh, that's what I take away when I talk to Jesus, that he's l- listening to all of our, us animal trainers and going, well, let's put some data behind that. <laughs> and they absolutely love that. When my seventh month, seven month old daughter grows up, I want her to be like you, Erica. I want her <laughs> to have uh, curiosity. And I think it's something... 
um, reflecting on an episode we did with Dr. Susan Friedman where she talks about something that excites her in 2020 is people asking quality questions uh, and, and that these are leading to, to, to data driven uh, and in some cases anecdotal um, new paths of exploration. Uh, where do you think <laughs> this is? This is a father question now. Sorry, podcast audience, but this is my show. <laughs> where do you think <laughs> your cre- your curiosity came from? Is that something that you had when you were a child? Yeah, I think so. My my parents were both uh, teachers. My mom taught kindergarten. My dad taught high school, and so I think they certainly prized education. And we did a lot of reading. And we did a lot of exploring in the natural world. And uh, like I said, they were really good parents in the way that they could identify my passion or my brother's passion and kind of let us run with it rather than trying to say, no, you ought to be a lawyer. It's like, you love animals? Great. We're going to do animals. Let's let's go get some more goats. So um, I think that was great. And, and letting me um, get to work with those animals, being responsible in part for them, but also helping me with the animals. So it wasn't just like, you know, a 10 year old <laughs> trying to take care of all the animals that they, it was really kind of a family affair. Um, but they, I think they really kind of um, nurtured, you know, in, inquiry into those animals and appreciation. And I think that's where a lot of my passion comes from is recognizing how much fun those animals are and how they have these like really individual lives you know, that's one of the things I liked was I could sit in my parents' um, uh, room and it looked out on our chicken coop and you could just watch the chickens doing their chicken things. And it was just so fun to watch all their social interactions and the things that were kind of going on in their chicken lives. And so I think getting to just sort of sit and watch animals and appreciate them being animals um, drives a lot of this. And and uh, having, you know, a lot of empathy for them I think drives my concern over humane training and uh, trying to improve how how humans interact with animals and getting them to understand what's natural animal behavior and making sure those animals get to be animals, but still kind of work uh, as seamlessly as possible into human lives. That might be the title of this episode. You could just watch the chickens doing their chicken things. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, it's fun because they have, they have such ridiculously complex lives. I mean, it's it's so funny. We think of them as very simple, and yet they have a lot going on. <laughs> I feel that about it, all, all animals. Um, and anyway, I'm, I was about to get sidetracked, but I'm going to stop myself from doing it. <laughs> you, you also said that our field is so rife with, with training law, and it's a potential uh, um, area of concern. I don't know. Is that a way of framing that? Uh, but but you're here with this great curiosity. You're, you're sharing it with me and, and with our podcast audience. Do you have any tips for those listening? Because I, I always uh, am open to um, opportunities to have conversations about curiosity. I, I see huge value in it. I want to build my own curiosity uh, and uh, curious to know if you have any words of wisdom for everyone out there about what they might do when they hear someone say dogs are just X or horses <laughs> are just a Y. Uh, yeah, my my thought is always to ask them, how do they know that? And usually, or oftentimes with especially these untrue statements, the non-scientific statements or less scientific, uh, it's, well, it turns out that their trainer told them and that and some other trainer told that trainer. And it just gets sort of passed down. Um, and one of the things I really want folks to think about is just when they hear those statements that sometimes are presented in a very, like I said, a very matter of fact way, and the person saying it is very confident that that is how it is, is for them to not take it at face value and to stop and say, even if it does sound scientific, to stop and say, how do we know that? where is your data? <laughs> and even if they don't have data, can they point you to some papers that have been published or at least some observations rather than, um, well, I just think it's this way or someone else told me. Um, I think for us in the training field, working our way back to, well, where where is the source of this? Is it coming out of data? And it might, even, might not even be data from dogs, but does it at least have basis in some scientific principles that we've learned from rats and pigeons in labs or um, from human behavior, but something that that speaks to some objective quantification and measurement, um, I think would be really great. So that's my my two questions that I would love people to ask are, how do you know that? 
And also when they're told something, even by scientists that say, even like me, dogs prefer food, their question should always be under what conditions? Because we know behavior is so driven by environmental variables that when I say dogs prefer food, that's because I've tested that under specific environmental conditions. And if I change those conditions, I can probably change their preference. So even coming from a scientific voice, uh, what I would love people to ask is, what are the conditions under which your statement is true? And where, what, what are the environmental conditions under what under which it's not true, because that will give us a sense of um, how behavior is controlled by environmental events. They're great questions, because it is a challenging thing to do, I feel, to be confronted with a, a confident uh, offering of mm-hmm. law, of opinion, right. uh, with labels intertwined in there that have to be interpreted, uh, and facts and opinion have to be deciphered. <laughs> so... Uh, they're great ones for me, and uh, I, I love that under what conditions one. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and how do you know that? And, and asking people to provide data and research uh, is something that you've been contributing uh, to our community uh, through the research you've been doing. So we're going to talk about that uh, really soon. But before we do, can you just let everyone know uh, what you're doing in 2020? Uh, and where people can go to find out more about you online and uh, get in touch. Sure. Um, so I'm out at Virginia Tech. We're in Blacksburg, Virginia. And I have a website, Erica N. Fuhrbacher. So you do have to spell out my last name. Um, uh, you can also find me on the Virginia Tech Animal and Poultry Science webpage. That might be an easier search. And you you're always feel free to, or you're always welcome to email me, enf007 at virginiatech.edu. Uh, as we're doing now, I love to chat behavior. I love to chat animals. So um, I'm always have to, happy to talk with folks. It might take me a little while to get back. It's kind of overwhelming right now, but uh, I appreciate chatting with folks. And really, I one of the things I love, and I, I know Jesus is the same, is talking to animal trainers because um, our field, I think our animal training field is so inquisitive and asks so many great questions. And seeing these great practitioners, we learn a lot from from them and can take it back and say, well, how would we study that? Or, you know, maybe I ought to look at this other thing. So I always learn from interacting with the other trainers. Um, so what I'm up to right now, uh, we are working on um, a nationwide fostering study for shelter dog welfare. I'm doing that in conjunction with Dr. Lisa Gunter and Dr. Clive Wynn at Arizona State University. So that's been ongoing for about two years. We're coming into our third year of that grant. So we're looking at the effects of uh, field trips and sleepovers on shelter dog welfare and what sort of in, what sort of organizational uh, qualities might impact the success of those programs, how many how many dogs they get out. Um, I have a number of grad students that are doing different things, uh, but one of our big emphases is certainly learning and training. So we've been running an equine behavioral husbandry class, and that's been a ton of fun with some undergraduates. So they're learning to do positive reinforcement training with horses. Uh, and in fact, one of my grad students, Hannah Decker, does scent training with dogs. And so I've roped her into starting some scent training with horses. So that's been fun. And then the thing that's taking up a lot of my time right now is we launched an online master's program through our online master's in ag and life science. And our concentration is applied animal behavior and welfare. So um, it's an all online program and it's really designed for professionals in the field that would like um, some more academic backing. So that one is really exciting to me. Uh, Lisa Gunter and I had been planning that for a long time. And uh, we have Jessica Heckman also helping uh, teach some of those courses. So that one's really exciting to me. And we have some great students in the program. Oh, neat. I I feel there's going to be listeners of this show who are definitely going to be keen to check that out. Uh, And you're also running courses on IAABC, is that correct? Yeah, so I have a fundamentals in animal uh, behavior and training on there. Uh, One of my graduate students, Joanna Platzer, is... uh, sort of running it right now, all the materials I provided, but she is doing the grading and interacting with students. And she's an, she's also a certified professional dog trainer and um, much like us, very passionate about animal welfare and humane training. So she's a ton of fun. Awesome. And a couple of questions. Field trips and sleepovers for shadow dogs, what do they look like? 
Oh, yeah, sure. So sleepovers are sending a dog out of the shelter for one or two nights. So it's a a really short term foster experience. Um, We had started this back in 2016 at Best Friends in Kanab, Utah, and they had a, a sleepover program running where dogs would go out for a night with volunteers. And there was internal discussion over whether it was beneficial for the dogs to get out or whether it was more stressful to send them out and bring them back and have that kind of upheaval. And so we evaluated that and found that their uh, urinary cortisol levels significantly dropped while they're on the sleepover. And they came up to baseline levels when they came back to the shelter, but not above baseline. So, of course, Best Friends is a really unique location. And so uh, we did this again at four other shelters across the U.S. that range from small boutique shelters to really large municipal shelters. And now we had the shelters send the dogs out for two nights. We saw the same effect that um, two nights out of the shelter, cortisol significantly decreased. Coming back to the shelter, it increased, but not above baseline levels. And at those four shelters, we also put activity monitors on the dogs and uh, found that their longest bout of uninterrupted rest occurred at the foster home. And so one of our ideas of why their cortisol dropped and they sort of de-stressed a bit at home was that they finally got some uninterrupted rest. Um, One of the really nice findings we found was that when they came back to the shelter, they weren't resting as long as they were at home in the foster home, but it was still longer than before they went on the, on the sleepover. So it seemed like there was some nice carryover effects there. So we've been exploring field trips more recently. Field trips are sending the dog out of the, out of the shelter for about two to four hours. So it's not an overnight experience. And our data so far suggests that it might function differently for the dogs, that it might not be a way to necessarily de-stress, but it is a way to, um, have them contact potential adopters and make some nice community connections. And that's that has all been funded by Maddie's Fund, which is really great. And right now we're also exploring, um, in the time of COVID, emergency fostering programs and how shelters are running those and their successes with that. Yeah, I know that there's going to be a lot of listeners that, uh, well, that had their ears perk up just then. Uh, as we have all of these new and great innovative ideas uh, being shared. Uh, our last podcast episode was about ideas for shouters as well. So <laughs> two oh, in a row great. for those working in shouters. Uh, <laughs> curious as well, because you've shared on your journey, you kind of followed your passion and your curiosity. What led you into shouter work? Um you know, I'm, yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. I had volunteered at some shelters before, uh, but I think in my mind that was a way to work with a lot of animals um, and was a, a job that I could tangibly see where I could work with animals that was not um, veterinary. And so I was, again, um, I felt lucky to get that job at Peninsula Humane Society and, and really get to explore that when I, you know, that was my first foray um, as a shelter professional. And so I, I was grateful for um, my boss, Maria Guren, there to give me a chance at it and uh, just had a, a really great time. And, you know, I think that that did really kind of kindle a passion for shelter animals and shelter workers. It is um, can be very rewarding, but it is hugely challenging too. So anything we can do to try and help the workers um, feel like they're making even more of an impact for the animals is great. So do you, do you see the path forward? <laughs> this is a very generic and open question. Do you see the, the path forward for shelters changing and, and shifting over with regards to how they run and how they operate and what's most effective over the next we while? We while defined by <laughs> five to <laughs> ten years-ish? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, seeing how sheltering has changed has it is very reinforcing for us um, going from a place where just unwanted pets go to doing a great job at promoting those pets for adoption. And now I think the shelters are taking an even more active role in their communities, not just being um, a safe haven for the animals, but really becoming an active community member of how do we serve the animals and the humans in our community. So I really love the um, sort of new emphasis on keeping animals in their home rather than, oh, you can't afford this medical procedure. Well, you'll have to surrender your animal. Can we help them afford that that medical procedure and keep that animal in the home so it never enters our shelter, uh, our shelter system? I think that's really exciting. And, you know, finding... 
I know sheltering is hard and we typically go into sheltering because we love animals. And I think recognizing that if we want to help those animals, we have to help the people is really important. Um, I think at times and historically, sometimes sheltering can be a little adversarial with um, the community because the shelter sees themselves as the rescuers for the pets and the people surrendering are the bad folks. And I think, you know, as, as good behavior analysts, we recognize that they are under unfortunate environmental situations and there can be lack of skills and there cer certainly can be lack of resources. And if we take a more, sh you know, a, more of a constructional approach to this and say, you're having a hard time with your animal. How can I help you? Um, how can I help keep the animal in the home? How can I be a resource to you? Do you need a food pantry? Uh, do you need resources? Not just does the dog need resources, but maybe they have housing instability. Can the shelter be kind of a um, a, a point of contact to help them get in contact with other folks that can help with housing instability? So I think recognizing the shelter as part of this sort of social network that can support the community members, both human and animal, I think is really exciting. And I'm always thrilled to see um, shelters move in that direction and being sympathetic to these folks that might feel like they have to surrender their animal and instead pointing them to some other options. And so many times these people do really want to keep their animal and they're just in, in a hard state at the moment. So the solution is just more behavior analysts in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Put them everywhere. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for sharing everything so far. We love hearing about what we call people's behavioral odysseys. So I appreciate <laughs> you sharing. Moving forward, we'd love to talk more about and, and hear more about uh, some of your research and there's some excitingly juicy content to get through. Can, <laughs> can, you, can you take us on a little bit of a journey through your um, experience and, and well, the right words not coming to me, through your research? <laughs> sure. Uh, so, you know, at, at UNT, I, my master's was in looking at concept formation in dogs, but from a behavior analytic standpoint, looking at how contingencies can build concepts in them. And uh, one of the things I, I think I learned from Jesus that I still appreciate is just having fun with your system. Um, I, I think sometimes people make science unfun of like, you know, they, they put pressure on themselves because they have to get this result to tell the story they want. And one of my the things that I appreciate most of, of working with Jesus was uh, having fun with your system, going out and just starting with something. We were going to train my dog to do match to sample just to see what happened. And what I noticed was that Arrow was making uh, very particular errors in his match to sample training. And so that set us off on, you know, whether he had a concept or not. And so I think that's a lot of it is just getting to go out, observe your system, really learn about it. Um, and I think that helps you make, that helps you uh, ask better questions and more relevant questions. And then just having fun with, I'm just exploring behavior. My animal will tell me the answer if I'm just asking the right questions. Um, when I headed over to University of Florida, one of my interests is why animals are social with us, why dogs want to hang out with us at all. I think we have... Um, in our society, a very romantic view about dogs, about being man's best friend and giving us unconditional love. And and yet we see, you know, millions of dogs coming into the shelter each year. So I feel like those, those two things can't both be true. Um, and that there's a science behind human animal interactions and there's a science behind improving them. And so that's really what I started looking into was what do dogs like about us? What interactions do they like from us? Uh, what can we use as reinforcers for our training, especially since, you know, some folks are still resistant to using food as a reinforcer. What are some other things we can use? Um, and so that sort of drove my research looking at dogs' preferences for human interactions. On the one hand, they are ridiculously simple questions. And my experiments are quite simple and straightforward. Um, and, and in one way, I like that because it makes them accessible. So I can have, um, you know, I'll do presentations for 4-Hers or things like that. And, th and they can run these experiments. It's, it's great. It doesn't take any special technology. And yet these are questions that hadn't been asked before um, of dogs. What do you like about humans? Um, why would you hang out with a human? Why would you choose to hang out with a human? And so I think that has been a lot of fun. And that still kind of threads through my research, um, looking at what can we use as reinforcers for dogs? Again, my question, under what conditions can we use those as reinforcers? So my, my work has looked at preferences for different human social interactions and 
trying to assess reinforcer efficacy of, uh, of those different interactions. How can we make food an even more effective reinforcer? Um, how do different parameters of food, like magnitude, affect behavior? And a lot of this is sort of on the, one, on the one hand, I really love basic research and I find myself drawn to it, but I want to work with dogs and horses and companion animals. So I kind of, you know, ride this line of some very basic questions, but I always see sort of an applied angle to those questions that I'm asking. So starting from the back there, you said one of the things I learned was to have fun with your system. Uh, with, for the uh, dog trainer at home, can you unpack what that means for them? Yeah. So I think just watching your animal and, you know, sometimes we get caught up in my dog needs to learn this behavior. He needs to lay down and stay. And I think instead of viewing this as it has to, um, of thinking about how can I help my animal learn this? And if my dog is making mistakes, why is it making mistakes? How am I cueing it strangely? Um, is there something with my reinforcement rate? So taking those errors and actually asking why are they making this error? Because there's something interesting there um, that I'm not capturing, right? I think I'm training well, and yet my animal isn't responding the way I want to. So we start to ask questions about, well, what can they perceive? And how does my timing matter? And how does the reinforcer I'm using matter? And so I think using those errors and, and starting to um, use that as sort of as a launch pad to understand more about animal behavior is uh, kind of what I hope people do. I think you said they have to get a result to get a story they want. So th does that sound like something you would have said? <laughs> so oh, yeah. I, I think, you know, sometimes scientists have committed to a worldview, and, and we all do, right? I, I come in with my own worldview um, that has been developed through my academic training, um, and so the questions I ask are driven by that worldview. The way I interpret my results in some way are driven by that worldview, the words I use to describe my data. Um, but sometimes I think we get too entrenched in that worldview and we always want to be data driven. And so if our results don't line up with that story we've been telling ourselves, then we have to change that story. So, for example, my one of my first papers was looking at social reinforcement as a reinforcer for dogs and comparing it to food. And generally speaking, of course, we had individual differences. Food was a more effective reinforcer. But uh, again, the question under what conditions, we were using four seconds of social interaction, so it was pretty brief. We were using a generic nose touch response and our sessions were just back to back to back to back. And so um, while I can say that generally food is a more effective reinforcer for most dogs, given that there's some individual differences. I don't want to just entrench in saying that social interaction is not a reinforcer for dogs. Instead, I want to see, you know, where are there breakpoints to that? Are there points where social interaction is a reinforcer? And so, I, you know, I don't want to get so entrenched in that story of food is a better reinforcer that I then uh, worry about my data in an upcoming study. Will it not show what I want it to show? And instead, just saying it's going to show what the data show as long as I'm running my experiment well. And then I can add to and modify my story, which is the whole story of science. It's interesting. And I'm, I'm glad I asked that question. And, and you mentioned about perception. Oh, I've added the word perception, but your, your worldview kind of influences, well, not kind of, it influences uh, how you offer information and, and how you also perceive information that others offer you. Uh, and when I say I'm glad I asked that question, because I was thinking about it from a perspective of a non-academic uh, potentially not training because they worry that what they're about mm. to do is not going to get them the result that they want. Uh, does it does it cross that chasm and apply to <laughs> a non non data driven people with their animals at home and and encourage is what you're offering encourage more uh, bravery in trying things out at home as well with our with our own or with our clients' animals? Yeah, I, I think it probably does. Where you know sometimes the training um, goal seems so large that it can be a little daunting, I think, to just launch. And if we remember, again, our shaping tools of, well, let's just start with that first little nugget. Let's just get that first step of that behavior. Can I break that big onerous training task down into little bits and work on that? Um, so then, you know, we get some reinforcement 
at a higher rate than we normally would if we are if if our only reinforcer was getting that terminal behavior or solving that whole behavioral issue that could be challenging but if we work on okay you have a dog that reacts on leash let's just try and get your dog to be able to walk down opposite sides of the street from another dog that's not barking at it and uh if we can do that great that's that should be reinforcing now let's take the take the next step so um yeah, I think, you know, learning to break things down into smaller pieces and having fun with it again. Uh, I know that can be hard, especially when those behaviors are challenging and scary and um, disruptive to the client's uh, home life. Um, but, you know, I think we do have to take those those first steps and just see, is this going to work? And recognizing even small behavior changes um, that, 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 that we're heading the right way. Maybe we didn't solve the behavior at all the first day, but maybe we got the dog barking a little bit less. We're headed the right direction. And one of the things I always tell people is if your if your concerns are changing, your worries are con- worries are changing over your about your dog or your training, you're making progress, right? You you're doing something. So we had a you know a pretty she was easy in some ways and very challenging in other ways. A, a rescued Malinois that had a lot of stranger danger and. You know, she passed away young at nine from hemangiosarcoma. And by then, we had made a lot of progress. She was still a dog that needed a ton of management um, to make sure she didn't <laughs> make foolish decisions and get herself in trouble. But looking back on her life, my concerns for her were always changing. It's like, okay, it used to be I was worried about you being in the dog park or meeting a dog off leash. That, that I think we're okay with. Now I'm worried about this part. Okay, I think we've solved that. Now I'm worried about this other thing. So, you know, I was always training and I was always managing and we were always trying to improve things. Um, And one of the things I, you know, tried to point out to myself that my that we were making progress was, yes, she and I are still trying to find our way and I'm trying to, you know, help her with some of her behavioral issues. My concerns for her, though, those behavioral issues that I'm worried about now have changed because I've solved some of those other ones. So, um, you know, I think trying to find all the pieces of progress to us is reinforcing. And, and sometimes it gets lost in the bigger picture of, you know what, she still can't go off leash hiking where I, you know, where I can't see people coming from a huge distance. It's like yes, but she can go off leash hiking now in certain in certain areas. So that's a that's progress. I love it, and I'm all about this for anyone who follows uh, Animal Training Academy or is in our membership. Uh, you'll know I borrow words from Dr. Susan Freeman and use them frequently, and that is celebrate approximations. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm all about what you're saying, and I find it so interesting right now that. Uh, there, there might be, and, and maybe my perception has uh, led me astray to fill the gaps in my knowledge of what you're saying uh, to suit my story. <laughs> but I, I find it interesting that there's parallels between uh, me as a non-academic uh, and the academic world, potentially with not. We're, we're focusing, can I say this, Erica? We're focusing too much on the bigger picture and not looking at the small approximations in front of us. Is that... Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to know what our ultimate goal is, so we we don't veer too far off of that. But I do think um, breaking it into little pieces is is really good, and certainly we have to do that as academics. Um, one of the things we have to do with new graduate students is they come in with a really great question, but it's huge. Um, you know, it seems straightforward, like I want to study personality in dogs, and it it. You know, it fits in like five or six words, and yet that is, you know, years and years and years of research um, just to get little snippets. And so part of what we do with ac- with academia is tailoring that back down. And I learn that the hard, hard way all the time, too, is I'll think, oh, you know what? This is a really simple question. This one is very bite-sized. It'll be really easy to answer. And then I start doing the research, and it's like, oh, there's, there's that little nuance. And, you know, what's – what – how am I going to schedule the trials? Is there going to be a break in between trials? That could matter. Um, what do I do with my hand while the dog's eating the food? All these things could matter. Do I use a condition reinforcer when I'm doing this study? How is that going to affect behavior? So this little very bite-sized research question, you know, can can turn into a whole dissertation with all the nuances if you wanted to study them. I think that's cool. <laughs> so if we're, if we're celebrating approximations in and then. How do we? How do we? Uh, how do? You, how do you? I should say. 
uh, how do you then uh, decide what to do next? So you've done a training session with your your animal, uh, and you've not you've got this big goal, and it seems the, the goal seems daunting and overwhelming, and it's influencing your home life. Uh, but you're like, I like how I did that little thing there, and the dog did this little thing there. Yay! Um, then, <laughs> how how do you set your next approximations? Uh, you know, trying to trying to think about what is next in that chain to get us closer to that that goal, and also, you know, what what's important to me right now. Um, I think I think there are a couple of things. Uh, can we see what is really next for the animal's behavioral repertoire to add to it? Um, um, what is important to the owner or to the client or to you that you need to solve next? There might be some things that are higher or lower priority. Um, but also I try and give people a break of what do you feel like training right now too? Um, and I, I tell this to my graduate students that you might not be able to write right now. Um, your brain is just fried and you can't write or you can't do your data analysis, there's something else you can do. <laughs> Let's try it. That's how you try and keep them, keep them working all the time. Um, can you do formatting? Can, can you just do something simple? Can you work on your citations? Or, um, yeah, can you just go through and make sure your margins are all set? And, and I learned that from when I was working on my thesis and dissertation was there are times when I'm like, I cannot write. I, I can't read more papers right now. I'm not in the mindset to, to write anything but you know what? I need to format this to meet the graduate, stu uh, graduate school requirements. So can I just go through and work on formatting, making sure things are in the right uh, font and have the right margins? And, you know, I, I think there are little things that if you are like, I'm stressed as a trainer, I'm a little overwhelmed, then don't put on yourself, I'm going to go train this hard behavior that's been a little daunting to me. Maybe I'll train this other thing that is still important, um, it seems easier, and that's all I can do right now. So I think giving yourselves a break as trainers, just like we give our animals a break, that um, you're not ready for this or you can't do this today, maybe tomorrow will be different. But if you're like Erica, when you go train that simple behavior, it turns into the behavioral equivalent of a dissertation <laughs> with all the areas of stimulus control and fluency you have to now consider. Um, Talking about some more of your research, actually, I, I wanted to catch something else you said there because I think you've offered a gift in this podcast episode that, I've, that I haven't considered before, but I feel like it's something in, in all seriousness and sincerity I will use moving forward for the rest of my life, and that is if your worries are changing, then you're making progress. It's gold. It's so simple, and I, I haven't. it's never crossed my mind. I'm, I'm thinking of examples in my life. Yeah, uh, and as, I, as we talk. Yeah, and I, I sort of think that we always think like, well, when I'm done, I'll, I'll have this perfect animal, right? It, we will be able to do everything together just the way I want it to. And that's not how behavior works. Behavior is always changing. Our animals always come up with <laughs> something new. You know, we solve one behavioral issue. And sometimes by doing that, an, another issue is revealed. It's like, okay, I wanted my dog to go off leash. So we got the off leash that she'll stick around. And by doing that, then it emerges that, oh, you know what? She has issues with men off leash. You know, maybe I hadn't encountered that before because we hadn't worked off leash before. And so once I've gotten the off leash part, there's this new hitch. Like, oh, there's this new thing that has been revealed <laughs> by solving that other issue. And, you know, I, I think having this view that we're not going to have that perfect animal at the end of the day. My, my German shepherd is pretty close to that. Uh, but it's even, you know, even then it's constant um, changing. Like he's going to change, right? He's going to learn. He's got his own life and, and he'll, he'll change through his experiences. And um, so recognizing that it's always kind of a, a dynamic and it's not going to be just one day where we're like, and now I have the perfect dog and I can relax. It's like... <laughs> We're, we're working with a, a living a living being, um, and so it's always going to be something new and exciting. And I think recognizing that uh, as the steady state uh, is useful. That's useful too. <laughs> uh, looking at the time, let's go back to some of your research. Uh, you talked about uh, how we can make food more effective, how different different offerings of food influenced behavior. So you talked about magnitudes of reinforcers. Can you talk about some of the results you found with that research? Yeah. So we were interested in looking at uh, the idea of making a party for dogs of the recommendation, you know, give them lots of little treats with praise. And again, this is one of the training lore things that um, we hear and it makes sense to us, but does that actually play out in the data? 
Um, so we tested dogs by giving them um, the same magnitude of food delivered all at once or delivered one by one as we told them what good dogs and uh, good boys and girls they were. Um, we used a progressive ratio schedule where if the dog did one nose touch, it earned reinforcement. And for us, for us, it actually had to do another nose touch, earn reinforcement. Then it had to do two and then three and then four. And so we kept adding on um, the amount of work the dog had to do for the same amount of reinforcement. And we get to a point where the dog uh, stops responding for a minute because it's too much work compared to the amount of reinforcement we're giving. That's their break point. And we, so we study where their break points were. We did not find any difference between um, break points for getting the food all at once with no praise or the one by one with praise. So we then looked at magnitude. So we um, we were using actually four treats. They were kind of um, like Bill Jack size treats or Zook's treats. I think we actually use pet botanics. Um, and so for the magnitude, we looked at giving the dogs four whole treats or one whole treat. And so the magnitude differed by a magnitude of four. What we found was that dogs were sensitive to magnitude. When we gave less reinforcement, their breakpoints dropped. So they, they were sensitive to magnitude, but not as sensitive as they should be if it were, if their behavior perfectly aligned with the magnitude. So we gave four treats and when we cut it down to one treat, so we're cutting it down to a quarter of what they were doing or what they were earning, they only cut their behavior by half. So they were actually working harder for those small treats than they should have. They should have reduced their behavior even more than what they did. But we did find that overall, if you want more behavior from your animal, if you want more of a, uh, an effective reinforcer, then larger magnitude does support more behavior. But for some of these really simple questions, for some of these really simple behaviors, you might get away with some of those very small treats. Um, the other thing that magnitude study did for us uh, is potentially answer a question of, um, you know, these trainers are telling us that making a party, they, they report seeing that that is more effective as a reinforcer. Um, that's anecdotal. They haven't recorded data, but their anecdotes might be entirely right. Um, but what I think could be happening is that when you tell somebody give lots of little treats, they end up giving a higher magnitude overall than they would have if you said give one big treat. So it's quite possible, and this is this is where I really you know think science is important. Those trainers might, in fact, like I said, be seeing that effect that telling somebody to make a party out of the reinforcement is more effective, but not because of the way they've delivered the food, but because it changed the human's behavior, and the human now gives you know, a higher magnitude of reinforcement. So it can work, but not for the mechanism that they thought. So I think this is where science helps us out a lot is sometimes we see something and it, we think we know why, but until we actually control those different variables, we don't know, is that actually what's driving this effect? Or is there something else subtle going on that I didn't recognize was changing? And so I, I want to make sure that... <laughs> People who listen to this podcast don't run out and just every time they see someone do something questionable, go, how do you know that? <laughs> I, I worry. Uh, have, you, have you found effective ways of having these conversations with people? Because I imagine, and I might be completely wrong and everyone's an individual, but if someone's quite confident about something uh, and they get questioned on that, uh, there might be other reinforcers at play rather than, hey, let's find what's actually true mm. here <laughs> with regards to yes. ego and uh, defend, getting defensive and defending oneself in front of a social gathering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have you found effective ways to have these conversations that, uh, that make it safe for people? I think one of the things you mentioned already was, you know, not doing it publicly is useful, you know, getting the person on their own so that if they do have a public persona, they're not being called out as being potentially wrong or um, not knowing what they're talking about. Because, the, you know, again, like I said, the, their anecdotes or what they're saying could entirely be right. Um, even if we don't have data, it doesn't mean just because we don't have data, they're wrong. Um, but I, yeah, so I would not do it publicly. And I think uh, one of the ways is to ask questions, not just say, and not just the, how do you know, but ask questions about, do you think if, uh, you know, you did this, that would change behavior, kind of pushing them with your questions to entertain bigger ideas. Um, so, you know, if we had somebody that was saying that, you know, the dog sleeping in their bed, uh, 
was causing these, you know, um, separation anxiety and bicycle chasing behavior problems. Um, you might even ask, like, have you have you seen that that alone is effective, or do you need to layer on some other things? But just, you know, kind of pushing to see, will they tell you what their um, their observations are. And in doing so, sometimes you find some other variables that you're like, oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder if, uh, you know, maybe it's just reinforcing the dog for staying home alone that is driving this and maybe the bed thing isn't. You know, I think acting like you don't know everything either. You're trying to explore this together of what do you think is driving this? That's so interesting that that you're seeing that effect. Um, you know, could, could we dig into that a little bit? But you're right there, especially depending on the person, those sorts of questions can be certainly more challenging. And and so coming in as a I don't know, what do you think about this, uh, I think is is kind of a, a helpful um, approach rather than you don't know what you're talking about. I don't either, but you but I know you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just just acting like you don't know because really you do know. No, I'm just. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's it is a challenging thing, and I, I liked your offering there um, about asking what others have observed. Um, I I I I worry myself as well when asking questions that people will ask. Why is he asking questions? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, does he have perceptions that he's not telling me? Like. Uh, so it's it's a tricky thing. So thank you for sharing that. One other note that I've got here, uh, when we caught up a few weeks ago, uh, is you mentioned you've done some research on how to assess reinforcers and then use them to solve behavioural issues. Yeah. So one of the, our studies looked at uh, yeah. identifying whether access to the owner was a reinforcer for dogs. And again, I think... Um, trying to explore what do we mean to dogs. Um, I, I would love to have <laughs> this. I, I remember Gene Donaldson just saying, uh, your dog doesn't want a bigger yard. Your dog wants you to be home more. And I, w I would love to have those sorts of um, questions and be able to ask our dogs that like, you know, I could take this job, it'll pay more and we can get a bigger house, but I'll be working longer. What, what would you like? Um, so I think that would be, you know, a ton of fun trying to figure out what do dogs really want from us and what do they need from us? And uh, so that question was really looking at the importance of the owner being present, not even just interacting, but um, being present for the for the um, for the dog's behavior and found that it was, in fact, a reinforcer. And I, I, I joke that folks that can't go to the bathroom by themselves anymore because the dog's knocking to come in already, you know, could have told us the um, answer to our, our research question that, yes, dogs will work to be with you. But then we applied that to dogs that had been owner reported for having separation related problem behavior. It wasn't a formal separation anxiety do diagnosis, but it was that the dog engaged in problem behavior when the owner was absent. And we used owner return as the reinforcer for those dogs. So contingent on good behavior, the owner would return and interact for a minute. And we started with really small snippets of time. Um, so the owner... We, what we started with was the owner stepping over the threshold, closing the door and coming back immediately. For some of our dogs, that was too much. And we had to actually start with the owner standing up, walking halfway across the room, contingent on the dog not barking, uh, the owner would return. And we did see that all of our dogs improved, although that improvement, as anybody with separation related problem behavior will tell you, is really slow going. So um, our data did, did point to those anecdotes being absolutely true. Hey, where can people go to find uh, a list of your research and get get uh, access to them if they would like? Yeah, so um, if you go to my website, ericaandfearbacher.com, there is a list of publications there. And for ones that have um, uh, that I can give access to, there are PDFs available there. Um, if there's something that you can't find and you're interested in, please just send me an email and I can send you a copy of the paper. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all of that, Erica. Sadly, uh, we're heading towards the final question for this episode, and you might have already touched on some of the things that you will offer when I ask you this. It's something we ask all of our guests. We started off going back to where you first got started. Now we want to look into the future. Can you share with the listeners of this show, please, what you would really like to see happen over the next five to 10 years in the animal training world? Yeah, so I, I have kind of two goals. One is I hope that positive reinforcement trainer, 
positive reinforcement training continues to um, spread its fingers into all these different avenues, uh, including livestock management, things like that. Um, we have a, a long ways to go still in the dog training world. We have a long ways to go in the equine training world. So I hope that it continues to make more and more forays into that. The other thing that I've been um, really concerned about and, and one of the reasons why we started our master's concentration is uh, I would really like to professionalize the field. Um, so I would prefer that folks that trained their um, pet dog once are not now considered professional dog trainers. I think I think behavior is much more complex and animals are much more complex than a, than a lot of people give them credit for. And um, it, you know, it takes time to become a good trainer. It takes experience with a number of animals and finding different techniques um, and learning to read animals. And so I would love to professionalize that because there is a science to what we do. Certainly there is an art, uh, but there is a lot of science. And I want folks that are practicing in our field to know that science, to know if I am going to use this contingency, what are the likely side effects? Um, am I going to produce fear in my animal? Am I going to produce affiliative behavior, knowing all the alternatives, ways of changing behavior without ever using punishment. And um, if something is not working for that animal or for that owner, that they have a deep toolbox that they can turn to other methods instead of, I use this method for all animals. And if your animal doesn't respond the way it should, then it's broken, then it's a bad animal. Um, so that's what I would really like is that we um, see the science behind this. And yes, people absolutely need their practical skills. Um, but I also want them to get uh, the academic backing. Um, our science has been around, you know, 100 years or more. And for someone to, <laughs> you know, train one dog or, uh, you know, their friend's dog and now think they know everything about behavior. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for professionally for 20 years or more and in school for a lot of those. And I feel like I'm just at the tip of the iceberg for what I can learn and what I can learn about animals. Um, and so it's always, you know, a learning journey. And I would really love to professionalize our field so that it's not so much a trade, it's a profession. It's no less complex than being a psychologist for children or a psychiatrist. And I think recognizing how complex and fascinating our system is, um, is important. So what, is, what does that look like to you, getting tertiary education? That's what I would love is that, uh, you know, eventually, um, whether it's a, you know, a two-year degree or a four-year degree, but something where there is some academic classes that folks take. I think right now, a lot of our trainers um, and, you know, have, have gone through schooling, um, but maybe not for this. And they we find our passions later and kind of switch uh switch gears. And so a lot of our, our um, organizations like IABC have been picking that, that educational component up, which is great. But I'd love to see that a little more formalized so that we know folks are um, getting really consistent education and that whatever organization you go through or school you go through, that you're getting actual science. Um, and I would love to have, uh, well, I'll go back. I think the IABC is pretty amazing. I think they do a lot to support their um, members in a lot of great ways. Uh, I know APDT does a lot of great classes too. There's a lot of good stuff out there. What I worry about is that um, without some sort of overarching credentialing, it is hard for trainers to know whether they're getting good content or not. And I think it's really hard for owners to know whether they're getting a good trainer or not. And I look back at my time with with Miel, that I was a very committed owner. Um, I was all into her and had a lot of experience with animals, not necessarily in training, but working with them. And I didn't know how to find a good trainer. You know, I ended up with less than good trainers and, and luckily I hit on uh, Catherine. But how does somebody that's not as invested as I was find a good trainer? So, you know, having some sort of credentialing, some sort of uh, responsibility for the animals in their care, um, and, you know, to me, taking, uh, you know, a one week quickie course on clicker training, uh, maybe that gets you started. But uh, I think our field is more complex than that. And recognizing that is important that you can't just, you know, take a two week course and, and be a pro and be ready to solve aggression cases. What, what would you include in a two year degree? Is it 
a behavior analysis degree? So I think that's really important um, is all the learning principles and the behavior change techniques that we can create using those basic principles. Um, I think also some ethology of learning how to read your animal, identifying stress signals, identifying warning signals. Um, uh, all of those are also really important. So our online master's program is really designed around folks being able to earn their associate certified applied animal behaviorist um, certificate from Animal Behavior Society. And that kind of combines um, uh, behavioral knowledge, um, learning theory, applications of learning theory with some of the biology that underpins behavior and um, uh, some ethology. So hopefully it gives us kind of a, a well-rounded view of the animal um, and what can drive behavior. So that's, I think that's where I would go to. I certainly love behavior analysis, so I, I come down very heavily on that. But for folks that, you know, haven't sat around for 20 years watching dogs, then taking some ethology courses to get a sense of how do they communicate, what is normal behavior, what's abnormal behavior, um, all the, you know, what's their sensory system like, what's their, what are they able to perceive, all of those I think are important too for trainers. Awesome. And, and for those, uh, hopefully, uh, num a number of ears have picked up and are keen to, after listening to this podcast, explore what you're talking about more, where, where did they go again? Can you remind us where people go to find out more about these programs? Yeah, for our online master's program, if you go to the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences at Virginia Tech, it is cals, C-A-L-S dot V-T dot E-D-U. If you look under academic programs, you'll find the online master's in ag and life science, and we are one of the concentrations there. Additionally, you can also email me at ENF 007 at vt.edu and I can send you information as well. Awesome. And any other websites or social media you would like to plug? Now is your opportunity. <laughs> Where can people go to find you online? <laughs> Uh, our lab does have a Facebook page, Applied Animal Behavior at Virginia Tech. So uh, I believe our shortened version is AABVT. So you can find us there. Uh, we post about some of our research projects and some of the fun things we're doing in our classes. Awesome. And we will link to all of us in the show notes as well. Erica, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, I had a whole page, whole pages <laughs> of notes and questions that I didn't ask you but for what we did manage to cover in this episode. Like I said, it's been a ton of fun. So from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and hang out with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. And, you know, like you said, we love to talk about our animal stories. So I appreciate you letting me tell them. <laughs> We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon. <laughs>